welcome everybody. My name is Star Zaworski. I'm the AmeriCorps Land Management Coordinator serving at Vermont Land Trust. Thank you for joining us today at the event. If you're not familiar with the Vermont Land Trust, we are a membership organization dedicated to protecting farmland, forest land, and community lands across the state. 11% of all the land in Vermont is protected under a VLT easement. We are thrilled to be joined tonight by Liz Thompson. Hi, Liz. An independent ecolo uh, ecologist with a fondness for forests, wetlands, and plants. Formerly a staffer with Vermont Land Trust and the Nature Conservancy, and a professor of botany at the University of Vermont. She currently works in a conservation outreach through wildlands, woodlands, farmlands, and communities, and it's new online quarterly from the ground up. Photography and walking in the woods are her favorite pastimes. We are grateful to have Liz join us this evening and share her expertise with us. Please welcome Liz with me, everyone. Um, Liz, if you want to just say hi, I'm going to give a couple more reminders. Uh, hello, everyone. It's so great to be here and I'm very excited to um, see some see some friends, people from all over. So thank you. Thanks, Liz. Before we begin, just a couple of quick reminders. We will take questions at the end of the presentation. So you can just hold on to those until then. Um, and if you do have questions, please use the Q&A feature, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. The chat is something different, so um, we'll just use the chat for uh, sharing where we're from and uh, not the questions. You can enter your questions at the Q&A and we will get to them in the presentation, like I said. If you'd like to have closed captions, please enable them yourself at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you have any difficulties with any of the tech issues, um, you can also put them in the Q&A and I will help you out. And now I'll turn it over to Liz. Thank you so much, Astara. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Vermont Land Trust, for hosting this event. It's just absolutely uh, so exciting for me to talk about and think about spring wildflowers. I it's true that walking in the woods is one of my passions for sure. So the title of this presentation is Waiting for Wildflowers, Spring's Gifts. And we're here on March 28th of 2024. Before many of the wildflowers that we're going to talk about have actually flowered, so this is really an anticipatory event. We're looking forward to what we're going to see. And we will see some things, uh, we'll, we'll talk about some things that have already flowered in, in a couple of minutes. But I wanted to start with a quote from Henry David Thoreau, who speaking about this time of year said, I do not know that the woods are ever more beautiful or affect me more. So here's an outline. We're going to talk about, and you'll see this outline again uh, repeatedly throughout the talk so we can keep track of where we are. We're going to talk a little bit about flower structure, just so we all understand when I use terminology, you'll know what I'm talking about. We're going to talk about a few wildflowers of March, and then we're going to talk about wildflowers of April. And when we do that, we're going to go by habitat by these different five different habitats, uh, dry oak maple limestone forest, limestone bluff cedar pine forest, rich northern hardwood forest, northern hardwood forest, and wetlands. And then I'll talk about a few books and resources that I like and a few places that you can visit to go see spring wildflowers when, when uh, the time comes. So um, some themes that will run through the talk are ecology and habitats, um, timing of things, some life history fun facts, pollination strategies, dispersal strategies, plant families and how plants are related to one another, and interactions with animals and humans. For example, how we, we might use or, or enjoy some of these wildflowers. 
So starting with flower structure, this is a photograph of a red trillium or stinking Benjamin. It's a, it's not a beautiful, well, it is a beautiful photo, but but it's it's messy in the sense that it has little specks of pollen actually on it. And there's a bug there, there's an insect on there. Um, but just for terminology, so the green parts of a flower, and this is a typical flower, but not all flowers are typical. This is a typical flower that has all the parts present. Um, not all flowers have all the parts, but this one does. And the outer whirl of, of parts is called, are the sepals. And collectively, they are the calyx. And then interior to that, usually, and those sepals are usually green, but not always. Anterior to that uh, are the petals, which are often colored, but not always. Collectively, they are known as the corolla. And then interior to that is a group of stamens. And the top part of the stamen is an anther. And then uh, in the middle is a... Um, it's the stigma, the style, and the ovary, or the pistil. But what you see there is the stigma. Think of sticky. It's the part that that the pollen sticks to. So that's the female part of the flower. That's where reproduction happens. So the, in, in the middle of the flower here is where reproduction happens. Then cutting that flower open from the side and looking at it, we can see that uh, those anthers, those long, narrow anthers. And then we can see the pistil, which collect, which is the stigmas, these stigmas that um, are, like I said, the sticky part where the pollen lands. And then often there's a, there's a stalk on that called the style. This one doesn't, doesn't actually have a stalk. And then there's the ovary. And the bottom part is the ovary, and that is where the seeds are produced. I'm going to take you to a tomato flower, um, which is one that that shows all these things um, in a in a maybe in a clearer way and with good a good diagram here. So we've got again looking at a cut section of a tomato flower. It's upside down because that's how tomato flowers present themselves on the plant. And we have the sepals on the outside. We have the petals, yellow interior. Then we have the stamens which is where the pollen is produced. And then interior to that, we have the ovary, the um, pistil. Collectively, this is all the pistil. So we have a stigma, the sticky part, the style, and tomatoes do have a long stalk of style. And then the ovary is the round part that turns into a tomato. And the little seed beginnings of seeds in, in the flower are called ovules. And then when the tomato matures, this is what it looks like on the right. As you all know, this is a very familiar thing. And that is the fruit. And you can see the remains of the stigma and the remains of the style on there. You can see the remains of the pedicel or, or flower stalk. And then all the ovules turned into seeds, matured into seeds there. So that is the basic uh, structure of a flower. And this is what's known as a perfect flower. It has all the parts both male and female, and it is also a complete flower. When you say it's a perfect flower, that means it has both male and female parts. When you say it's a complete flower, that means it has sepals, petals, and stamens, and pistil. Okay, so with that background, we're going to look just a little bit at some wildflowers that I was fortunate enough to see in March, so before this. So pussy willows, willows of many, many kinds. There are a couple dozen kinds of willow in Vermont. Um, it's hard to identify them at this time of year when they are in the pussy willow stage. This photo was taken a couple of weeks ago, but um, willows are real, pussy willows are, are of course very familiar and easy to recognize. And one of the cool things about willows is, is that their bud scales are, there's only one bud scale. So it's a single like, like cap. Um, on the on the bud. And then we have speckled alder, which is flowering at this time of year and just beginning to produce its flowers, two kinds of flowers, by the way. And then we have, this is really one of the fun ones. Then we have beaked hazelnut. This picture was taken on March 10th um, in a place near me. 
uh, in northwestern Vermont. It's a common plant. It's a very common shrub in the woods, um, but it's a little hard to these flowers are really tiny. They're only about three or four millimeters wide. But look at this. There's two kinds of flowers here. So these are not perfect flowers. These are these are unisexual flowers, they're called. So the male flowers are gathered here um, in that long structure in the middle, sort of middle of the photo. The male flowers are gathered in what's called a catkin. And this is a member of the birch family, and this is characteristic of the birch family, that it has unisexual flowers. So male flowers on the left and then female flower on the right. And those bright red things are the stigmas, which are, which are going to gather the pollen. These are wind pollinated. The wind blows the pollen around the air, and that's how they get pollinated. So you'll see th this kind of arrangement in the birch family. And there's a close-up of, the, um, of the flower. And there's a close-up of the male flower. So you can see inside each of these, these units here, there's a bunch of, you can see what are recognizable as a bunch of stamens. And then we have red maple that it has bloomed um, and uh, has, these are the male flowers of red maple. So you can see these are stamens. And then, and ma maples are typically have unisexual flowers, but not always. It's not always true. So these are male flowers, and these are the male flowers that have landed on the ground. So once they flower and produce their pollen, they just fall to the ground. So this is what you'll see now. Um, in the lower uh, lower left, you'll see Brian Pfeiffer, um, who generously uh, offered his, his photos for use. If you don't see a name uh, attributed in a photo, it's it means it's my photo. So most of them are mine, but some friends of mine who are better photographers than me uh, donated their work kindly. And then there is the female flower of red maple. We also have silver maple. This was taken a couple of weeks ago in my neighborhood. You can see there's actually snow falling in this picture, <laughs> but the silver maple was nevertheless flowering. And again, these you can recognize silver maple because its branches swoop. Um, so it has this, this sort of um, swoop to the branch, and that's how you easily recognize silver maple. These grow in floodplains along rivers, but also are commonly planted as ornamental trees. And this was in somebody's yard, actually. Um, and so there's male flowers, and those are the female flowers of the silver maple. And there's a close-up, again, by Brian Pfeiffer. Beautiful photograph. In this photo, interestingly, you see both female and male parts in the same flower. M maples are, textbook maples, red maples uh, and silver maples are have unisexual flowers, do not have mixed parts in, in one flower, but this one actually does. So they don't actually read the book all the time. And then this is something that I saw uh, recently, and it looks like a flower, but it's actually not flowering at this time of year. This, but I, but I wanted to put it in because lots of people look at this and say, oh, what's that flower? And if you look at it closely, you'll see here, um, it is the remains of last fall's flower. It, this, is, this is witch hazel and it flowers in the fall, very late in the fall. It's one of our latest flowering shrubs. Um, and these are the leftover, the petals are gone, but these are the leftover sepals on the flower. Really attractive at this time of year and, and very persistent. Okay, so those are some shrubs and trees, but now look at what's, um, there's a typographical error here. This is Colt's foot. And this is, this is a thing that has flowered. It flowers along roadsides. You've probably seen this, looks sort of like a dandelion. Um, and it's in, of course, the same family and related to dandelions, but these have flowered. And um, this is not a native plant, but uh, a nice thing to see at this time of year. Now here's another one, look at this on the forest floor. And I'm just looking at my notes. Okay, what was the date on this? Uh, the 8th, March 8th was when I saw this in Burlington. And this is not something you actually see a lot of in, in Vermont, um, but I didn't put the name on this because I want you to ask yourself, do you know what this is? It is skunk cabbage. So you'll see it on the forest floor in wet places and also growing right in water. Simplocarpus fetidus, skunk cabbage. And there are the leaves of skunk cabbage. And this is the flower. When you look inside, 
that um, look inside this thing, which is called a spade, inside there, this is what you see. These are the flowers gathered in a bunch and on skunk cabbage. And they're just, look at them closely. They're just fascinating. Those are the stamens producing pollen and the pistils are not visible in this photo. But um, but a fascinating flower. And one of the really interesting things about it is that it actually produces heat. The plant itself actually generates heat and it melts snow. And where I saw it, there was no snow to be melted, but it actually produces its own heat. And that's that's how it is able to flower so early in the year. So those are some things flowering in March. Now we're going to go on to wildflowers of April. So things that we haven't yet seen or that I haven't yet seen. Maybe some of them have been seen by you or somewhere to the south, um, but some flowers that we, we have not yet seen. And we'll talk about some of their, just how to identify them, where they grow, uh, life history strategies and, and so forth. Um, but I, I will uh, just, it, a lot of this is really about, sort of about what Thoreau said. It's really just the pleasure, the, the joy of, of seeing these things. Um, it's just the woods at this time of year are amazing. So one of the habitats that we'll focus on is dry oak maple limestone forest. This is a picture that was drawn in Niquette Bay State Park, which is one of the places I recommend that you go if you are in northwestern Vermont or can get to northwestern Vermont. It's an easily accessible park with beautiful displays of spring wildflowers of all kinds. Libby Davidson uh, made this illustration for the book Wetland, Woodland, Wildland. And I sat with her while she drew this picture. It was really fun to do. So this is the kind of habitat where you'll see um, the, there's a, a lot of ledges, exposed ledges. The soil is shallow. The soils are so, somewhat dry. And we have oak and maple. And uh, the, the bedrock is calcareous. It's not exactly limestone always, but it, it has some calcium carbonate in it and produces a lot of fertility. So this is a, a photograph from the same place. Um, so you can see a lot of the things that are growing there and the mossy rocks. One of the things that grows there in abundance is bloodroot, Sanguinaria canadensis. Uh, sanguine means, um, well, it, ha it has different meanings, but the actual root of the word has to do with blood. So the, here you see the flowers enveloped by the veiny leaves on the forest floor. And here, this is uh, a, a why this is called blood root. Here is the, this is actually the root itself are the spine things, but the horizontal thing is a, is a rhizome, an underground stem. And you see that when you break that, it's red. And here's a leaf that um, was broken and, and the drop of, of milky of red sap is coming from the plant. This is a member of the poppy family. And this colored sap, colored juice is characteristic of that family. So it kind of looks like my finger is bleeding in this photo, but that's, that's the plant bleeding. And here again, is another photo showing that the, the, leaves wrapped around those protecting those delicate flowers because this flower is very early. It's going to be flowering very soon if it's not already. Uh, one of the earliest flowering things, early April is when I tend to see it. And then um, and then the flowers, as, as it warms up, the flowers kind of emerge and pop out from that protective leaf. And then they begin to they begin to expand and show their interior and invite insects in. Look at that veiny leaf. Isn't that the coolest thing? And then here's what it looks like when you look inside that open flower. So you can see here, you can see the, the petals and actually the sepals and petals. Um, you, don't see, you don't see green sepals, right? Because the sepals um, have fallen off and the, the uh, petals are there. I, excuse me, I take that back. There's, the sepals are white, so they look just like petals. And then um, you can see stamens inside the yellow things in the very middle of the flower is the pistil and that's where the fruit is gonna be produced. And there is the fruit, there's the pod, the fruit that is being produced by this plant um, beginning to, and then the leaf has really expanded widely now. But look, if you open that 
open that fruit and look inside, you can't see in the lower left, I don't believe, but this is a photo by my friend Kent McFarland of the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, and he generously shared this photo. But look at those seeds. They have, uh, the seed itself has a special part called an eliosome on it. That eliosome is fatty and nutritious, and this is something that attracts ants. And so ants, this is a winnow ant, and the ant will take that thing and move it to its nest and, and use that eliosome, that fatty uh, appendage, to feed its young, thereby distributing, moving, um, dispersing the plant from place to place. Now, the fascinating thing is many of these plants that live in the forest are ant dispersed by this method. Many of our spring wildflowers are ant dispersed. So think about it. If you clear a forest and turn it into farmland, and then it turns back into forest again, as is the story of so much of Vermont, how long is it going to take for the wildflowers to get back into the woods if those seeds, if there's not seeds in the soil, which if it's been farmed for a long time, there won't be. A long time. How far can an ant walk in a day? I don't know exactly, but it's not that far. So this is um, a, the dispersal of these things often is, is slow um, in terms of how far they can go. So some other plants in the, in the same um, sort of timing um, in the dry oak maple limestone forest, this is hepatica, blunt-lobed hepatica. Um, this is in the buttercup family. And you can see that there are sepals, green sepals and petals and stamens and pistils. And as you probably, you, if you know hepatica, you know that it can come in many colors. It can be this sort of, this uh, light um, lilac. It can be almost light pink. It can be pure white. And look at, there's, there's the stamens on the outside and those stamens are white. And here are a bunch of pistils in the middle. So not just one, but a bunch, which is characteristic of the buttercup family. It can be this pale pink. And again, thanking my friend, John Tagliaferro for the photo. Or it can be blue, light blue, or intensely dark blue. Beautiful range of colors in this, in this flower. I've had people ask me, does this have to do with the soil chemistry or something? And no, it's not. It is a, um, it is a trait much like eye color in humans. It's a heritable trait. Um, it goes with the, the plant and it's, it's simply genetic and um, has no purpose that we know of. There is another um, species, there's blunt lobed hepatica, and then this one is sharp lobed hepatica. So you see the blunt lobes on the leaves here, and then sharp lobed hepatica is another species. So there's two species of hepatica. And you'll see they're called hepatica, but the genus name is anemone. So they are related to anemones. And there's the sharp-lobed hepatica leaf. And here's another one that is extremely rare in Vermont. It looks a lot like a hepatica, except for the leaves. The leaves don't look like it. This is called rue anemone, and it's thalictrum thalictroides. Okay, so look at the, in this picture, you'll see some hepatica in the background, but I was distracted by what was in the foreground, by what was in front of those hepatica, which is a beautiful, beautiful thing. This is a sedge. And here is the sedge that I was looking at, pedunculate sedge. And some people will occasionally challenge me, people who are not you, but people who are maybe not quite as interested in botany and plants as you are, might say, why, why are you showing us pictures of sedges? They just look like grass. Well, it's important because sedges comprise about 10% of our native flora. There's a lot of them. There's, there's many, many species in Vermont. And so it's worth paying attention to them and knowing them. This one's called pedunculate sedge. It has this long drooping stalk, which is very recognizable and it flowers early in the spring. There's its flowers, and here are the male flowers. So it has separate male and female flowers. These are the male flowers. Oops, I'm sorry. These are the female flowers at the top with the stigmas, and these are the male flowers with the stamens sticking out. So you might see one more sedge or two, because <laughs> I really like them. Another plant that you'll see early, early in the year is in April is wild ginger. 
and it is flowering. The flower is right on the forest floor and hard to see sometimes. You have to sort of stoop down to see it. But look at that flower. Is that the coolest flower? That is such a fascinating flower. This plant is, it's a weird color, right? It's dark red. And it also, you it has a has an odd fragrance if you get down really close to it, flower itself. Um, and there's a, a look at the flower. And it is actually pollinated by carrion flies. These are flies that like dead meat. And they like the smell and the, the color of, uh, of wild ginger. So it's a really interesting sort of mutualism. Um, Dutchman's breeches is another plant that is very early flowering on the forest floor. The flowers themselves look like little pantaloons. And this is some, this is uh, somewhat related to, um, to the bloodroot that we talked about earlier. And these are the underground parts of the Dutchman's breeches. Again, the looking at this, if we look at the seeds of Dutchman's bridges, again, we see these projections. They look different than what they look like on the blood group, these projections that are fatty and that attract ants. So these are ant dispersed as well. And then squirrel corn is a closely related plant. Now you recognize this if you have a, a grow um, bleeding heart in your garden, this is related to the bleeding hearts but those are pink and, and this is white. And the squirrel corn, the underground, underground parts are these yellow units, which are in fact eaten by and enjoyed by squirrels. And that's um, to some extent how they can, um, if, if the squirrel maybe moves a bunch of these and caches them, this is a vegetative reproduction or a vegetative um, way of the plant getting around. Um, if they move them and then forget about them, they can move them to a new location. Also in the dry oak maple limestone forest is this really fascinating shrub called leatherwood or wickapee, Durca palustris. And there's a closer look at it. Three hanging yellow flowers with the long stamens sticking down, uh, the long stigmas sticking down and then the stamens around them on the outside. This is a fascinating plant because getting back to Thoreau, when he traveled to Southern Vermont um, at some point in his travels, he found that people were using this plant, using the twigs, uh, not the twig directly, but using it as, um, as twine to, to hold together fences. So if, if the plant is called leatherwood, so if you take one of those twigs and try to break it, you can't break it. It actually just bends because it's got, it's very pliable, and so it has been used. Um, it's been used for uh, making sandals and also for holding fences together by people, um, by native people, and also um, by settlers. Okay, can't have a spring wildflower talk without uh, talking about white trillium, trillium grandiflorum. Oh, fascinating, beautiful, just fabulous plant. This is the same place, Niquette Bay State Park, that dry oak maple limestone forest and the sea of white trillium that grow there. Uh, just beautiful plants. And there they are again. And there they are. This is actually, um, this is an interesting insect. Um, I'm just going to look here and remind myself so I don't get this wrong. This is a flower longhorn beetle. And so it's a, a native beetle that um, there's many kinds of flower longhorn beetles. So if you look that up, you'll, you might not see this exact um, match or image, but, but this is one of the flower longhorn beetles. They feed on pollen and sometimes on nectar, but generally, generally on, on pollen. And so they are, um, they do uh, help fertilize or, or pollinate the plant. And there it is down in the middle of the flower. Now, if, look at this. This is, uh, this is a flower of a white trillium that has turned pink. And again, I've had people ask me, is there another species? Is there a pink trillium? I know there's red trillium and painted trillium and white trillium. Is there pink trillium? And what happens is the white trillium actually turns pink 
um, as it ages. So it is simply a white trillium that is that is aging and showing its pink pigment. And there you can see a collection of trilliums with some of them having turned um, pink, just all mixed in with the white ones. Well, okay, so another, some more plants. Well, this, is, this is one that I just absolutely love. This is called Early Meadow Rue. Uh, earlier, a couple minutes ago, we talked about Rue anemone. And um, this is in the same genus, the genus Thelictrum. So it's a meadow rue. And the way the leaves unfold is so fascinating. They're wrapped around, again, they're wrapped around the flowers and protecting the flowers. And they unfold kind of like a deck of cards, just really fascinating. Now, this plant is a plant that, like some of the trees I showed you, has unisexual flowers. The flowers are either male or female. Here are male flowers with stamens. And here, is, here are female flowers with stigmas. So you see the difference, the stamens hanging, hanging down and the stigmas, they are ready to capture the pollen. These are wind pollinated. And the flowers, the male and female flowers are found on separate plants. So you'll have male plants and female plants. And that condition is known as dioike or the plant is known as dioecious, meaning that it has Oikos from the word um, oikos meaning house, and it's what the word ecology came from. So dioecious, this is a dioecious plant, and its name is Thelictrum dioecum. Not all Thelictrums are dioecious, by the way, but this one is. Here's another early th flowering thing on the forest floor in the dry oak maple limestone forest, Herb Robert. I'll bet you're familiar with this. It flowers very early, but you know what? It flowers all summer and it flowers late. You can see this late in the fall, um, which is really unusual. Um, these other things that I'm showing you will, will not be flowering late in the fall. And there it is, close up. Another thing in these woods, um, which is a treat, a rare plant that is fun to see, is yellow lady slipper, Cypripedium parviflorum. Well, that is the dry oak maple limestone forest. Let's move along now to the limestone bluff cedar pine forest. Now, these places, limestone bluff cedar pine forests, are a rare, considered a rare community in Vermont. Not because it's hard to find them; they're actually kind of easy to find if you go to the right place. They're right on the bluffs, on the on the rocky bluffs, on Lake Champlain. But the size of them is so small that collectively there's just not a lot of this natural community. And many of them have been converted or trees have been cut down to create views where people live near the shoreline, etc. But some places you can go to see these are, for example, Niquette Bay State Park, um, Kingsland Bay State Park, uh, Lone Rock Point, uh, Red Rocks Park in Burlington. So a lot of places in Chittenden County where you can go and see this natural community. Okay, here's one more sedge. Ah, there might be one more after this. This is called ebony sedge, and it is really one of my favorite sedges. I'll, I'll be honest, it's my favorite sedge. <laughs> this is a tiny, tiny, tiny thing. This whole plant that you're looking at is standing about maybe four inches tall. And looking closely at it, there you see the flowers of the sedge. And again, it has separate male and female flowers, but on the same plant. So at the top are the female flowers where the fruits are being formed, and down below are the male flowers. Here's another look at it. Well, another thing that grows on these limestone bluff cedar pine forests is wild columbine. Now, let me just back up for a second and tell you that whatever plant I show you, it's not specific to that natural community or that habitat necessarily, but that's where it's most commonly found. So wild columbine you'll find also in dry oak maple limestone forests, in rich northern hardwood forests, and in other natural communities as well. But if you want to go and see some, definitely go to a limestone bluff cedar pine forest to see wild columbine, gorgeous, gorgeous plant. Again, in the buttercup family, does it look like a buttercup? Not much, but it's related to them. 
And there it is closer up. And this is pollinated by hummingbirds. Look at those long spurs on that flower. At the top of each of those spurs, the long, narrow thing, um, at the top, which is really the bottom in a sense, but is a little drop of nectar. So a hummingbird is gonna stick its proboscis up there and get that little bit of nectar. And in the process, it's gonna have some pollen land on its body. It's gonna move to the next flower and therefore pollinate the flowers, cross-pollinate the flowers. Another one in this natural community, and I'm just gonna go forward for a second. This is what it looks like when it's flowering. And you can see the, you can see the lake in the background so that you can see the habitat. This is early saxifrage. Actually, you can see a pedunculate sedge in the lower right-hand corner of this photo as well. But um, I, going back to this photo, this is what it looks like before it's um, produced its flower stalk where it's still just in tight bud. And a friend of mine, a young friend of mine who was about 10 years old at the time when I was walking with her a couple of years ago, called it cabbage plant. I thought that was really great. I'd never heard that name, but she called it cabbage plant. And there's a close-up of the flowers. Again, this has all the parts, peoples, petals, stamens, and pistils. Another white flower related actually to the um, early saxifrage is bishop's cap or miterwort, which has an incredible, beautiful um, flower with fringed petals that look like feathers beautifully fringed petals. And these things are tiny. They're a quarter of an inch wide, maybe. You have to really get down on your hands and knees to look at these and see them. And the reason that it's called bishop's cap is because the fruit um, looks a little bit like the cap that a bishop wears. This is the bishop of the Episcopal Diocese in Vermont, Shannon McVean Brown. And you can see that the fruit of the bishop's cap looks a little bit like the cap that she wears. Okay, going to rich northern hardwood forest. Another sedge, one of my favorites, plantain leaf sedge. Um, look at those leaves, very, very distinctive. This is a sedge that you can identify really any time of year. Um, just so distinctive with those wrinkly leaves, very wide wrinkly leaves, grows in rich northern hardwood forests. And there are the flowers, there is the, um, there are the stigmas and the stamens. And then another uh, another flower on the forest floor in rich northern hardwood floor for forests is round-leaved violet, a yellow violet, Viola rotundifolia. Look at those shiny leaves on this thing. That's how, how one of the ways you can recognize it, again, even without flowers. There's many, many violets in Vermont. There's um, at least three that have yellow flowers. So this is, this is not the only yellow flowered one. Now, toothwort um, is an interesting plant that grows in rich northern hardwood forests. This is a member of the mustard family. So you can actually snip a little tip of that leaf, put it in your mouth, and it'll, it'll have a mustardy flavor. And you can see that it has four petals, which is characteristic of the mustards. If you've ever seen a mustard in flower, you know that they have four petals. Fascinating thing about this plant is there is a strong mutualism here. Again, these photos are by Kent McFarland, who taught us about this, that the West Virginia white is a butterfly that is an obligate, um, is obligate on toothwort, on the two, two or three different species of toothwort. Um, it needs toothwort for its larva to develop. And that's the larva in the lower right-hand corner of this, this composite photo. So that's, um, that's a really um, interesting thing. And what's one of the things that's interesting about it, as you think about it and you think about climate change, one of the challenges of climate change is the timing of things, is the timing of the flowering of the toothwort the same as the time of the emergence and the the need to lay eggs and the need to develop of the West Virginia white. Not always. There's, there, there's a disconnect um, beginning to show in some places. 
So this is a, this is sort of a worrisome thing when there's such a strong mutualism uh, that that the um, the timing can affect uh, the, the success of this particular insect. Okay, other plants in the spring woods, early blue cohosh, really what a weird color this is, huh? It's just fascinating as it emerges. And there's another beautiful Brian Pfeiffer photo of it flowering. Uh, fascinating thing here is that this flower, the outer parts are actually not petals. Those are sepals. And then interior to those, the bumps, the sort of um, C-shaped bumps, those are actually modified petals, and they have um, their their base, basically glands, and then there are stamens and pistils inside of that. And here, uh, we're, what we're looking at here is a wasp mantid fly. Do you see that thing out of focus on the right? This is a wasp mantid fly. It's neither a wasp nor is it a fly. It's something entirely different, but that's the name that it has. And it is going toward that flower and there it is landing on the flower and it is going to be a pollinator. There's actually a second species of blue cohosh in Vermont. There's two species. There's the one, this one, um, that has the deep purple flowers. And then there's one that has more yellow flowers. And these flowers will actually turn quite just plain old lemony yellow as they mature. Speaking of lemon yellow, there's large flowered bellwort, which grows in rich northern hardwood forests. Um, and there's another, there it is uh, looking a little closer up, a beautiful plant um, that is easily recognizable in the rich northern hardwood forest. But let's go to the northern hardwood forest, our common, commonest natural community in Vermont, um, covering much of the landscape of Vermont, sometimes called beech birch maple forest. And one of the common early spring wildflowers there, and also in rich forests and lots of different kinds of forests, but common in the northern hardwood forest is spring beauty, Claytonia caroliniana. Now this one shows what we, we've seen, but haven't talked about it yet, shows what some flowers have, which is a nectar guide. If you look at this flower, you'll see that there, it's like a landing platform for insects. It says, come on, come on right down to the middle. Those, those lines lead it in um, just like a, a plane landing in an airport. And then the yellow color shows the center so that they are attracted to the nectar that is in the bottom of the flower. Um, that they, they know that that's where the nectar is going to be and thereby pollinate it. Well, another bellwort, um, this is a common one in northern hardwood forests. This is Cecilie bellwort, otherwise known as wild oats. And then another one, this is a This is another Brian Pfeiffer photo. This is a fascinating plant, common, common plant. Um, and, and I'm sure you've seen it, trout lily, also known as dog tooth violet. It's not a, it's not a violet, um, but it is a lily in the broad sense. And um, it's called trout lily because the leaves are mottled like the leaves, uh, li like, the, like the body of a, a trout. Interesting thing about this, it's got two different stamen colors. And this is genetic also, sort of like, like I said, with the color of hepatica, it's genetic. It's not, um, not environmental. So there's yellow ones and there are dark red ones and uh, different clones, different groups of plants will have one or the other color. Um, this is a, um, this is a, an insect that's a, a bumblebee that's visiting this, this, oh, and there's also, look, you see there's another, another insect there on the left, but this thing approaching this flower um, is approaching the, to, to pollinate. And there's a bee fly. So that, this one is a bumblebee. This one is a bee fly again. Um, and a bee fly is um, also just, you know, it's kind of a fascinating creature that, that is, is a fly. It's not a bee. It looks like a bee, um, but it's it's a, it's actually a fly. And it has a long proboscis that it uses to you see that to to get into the flower and get the nectar. And here's what we often see on the forest floor. We often see a sea of leaves of trout lily without flowers. Sometimes, sometimes just a bunch of leaves and no flowers. Why is that? It, it's because each plant takes it takes about six years for the plant to get to the point where it can actually um, 
have enough energy in, stored underneath the ground to produce flowers and fruits. And this is a fascinating thing that you'll see on the forest floor later after the leaves have actually withered and gone away. You'll see these white things and you'll look at them and go, what is that? Um, these are called droppers and they are a way that the plants get around vegetatively. One of those leaves will, one of those plants will send forth this dropper, this over the ground stem to, um, to create a new plant. And the little seedlings you see there are not the new plants. Those are something else, but, um, but, but new plants will be, so this is how they get around vegetatively. And that's why you'll see a whole group of trout lily on the forest floor. That is what has created that group of plants. Okay, another one, red trillium, which is also known as wake robin or stinking Benjamin or nosebleed is a name for it. This is another one that has a deep red flower and is also um, pollinated by, by carrion flies. And I'm showing you this flower, this picture, because uh, when I observed this flower uh, in my woods a, a few years ago, I went out the next day and this is what I found. <laughs> I found just the stems. The deer had come and plucked off all the flowers to get the nutrition that is in the flowers, the nectar and the pollen. Um, probably deer that are females that have that are um, pregnant with young and just need some nutrition. It didn't make me terribly happy that they chose to do that, but but there you have it. The other trillium we have in Vermont that's common is painted trillium uh, with the white in the pink center. Some other plants in the in the common in the northern hardwood forest: Canada Mayflower. Foam flower, long spurred violet. You see that spur on the violet. Again, there's lots and lots of violets in Vermont, but this is one of the common ones that you can easily recognize. And then hobble bush, uh, which is a shrub that flowers in May, in April and May. Um, and you'll see this in flower in the northern hardwood forest. And finally, in some wetlands, um, just a couple of plants of wetlands. One of the common things that you'll see in wetlands is marsh marigold, Calpha palestris, just a joy to see um, in the early spring. There are the flowers of it. It's in the buttercup family. It's related to the buttercups. It's it, it's um, called marigold, but it's it's in the buttercup family. And you can, you can make that connection. It kind of looks structurally, kind of looks like a hepatica, really. And then golden alexanders, uh, which is doesn't have to grow in wetlands, but it often does grow in wet places. And um, this is sometimes mistaken for uh, wild parsnip, which is a non-native species that is invasive and, and poisonous to the touch, uh, no, um, creates a rash. Um, you're probably familiar with that. This is sometimes confused with that, but this is a native, beautiful plant called golden alexanders. It's smaller than the wild parsnip. And then finally, here are the willows. We've seen them already, but here they are actually flowering. Just wanted to show you that with some dates so that you can see what's coming up for those willows as they mature. And then um, highbush blueberry, one of my favorites, which is a great thing to see in wetlands. And I believe this is this is gonna be the, um, the last one. Uh, Rhodora, and I wanna just read you a little bit of a poem from Wealth. Ralph Waldo Emerson called the Rhodora, uh, just an excerpt. If the sages ask thee why, Rhodora, if the sages ask thee why, this charm is wasted on earth and sky, then tell them, dear, that if eyes were meant for seeing, then beauty is its own excuse for being. So with that, we'll talk about, just show you some books and resources in the follow-up email. These will be listed. Um, so don't worry about writing them all down now. Um, Go Botany is a great resource, the Vermont Atlas of Life. Um, and then a couple of books. Uh, Walden Warming is an interesting, getting back to Thoreau, is an interesting um, take on, on the changes of, of uh, flowering time, as I discussed. And a few places to visit. This is, you can visit the Vermont Land Trust land map and each of the places will tell you um, how you get there and, and how long it's been protected, how big it is. So here's a list. Again, you'll get this in your follow-up email. So we will open it now for questions. 
All right, so our first questions are, um, what was the park mentioned when starting the flowers of April? What's that? Can you say so it again? Someone was asking, it was towards the beginning of the presentation, what was the park mentioned when uh, starting the flowers of April? I think you might have mentioned multiple parks. But... Nickette Bay State Park is one of my favorite places to go. Nickette Bay, it's in Colchester, um, a state park, beautiful place to go. I may have also mentioned Kingsland Bay State. I did mention Kingsland Bay State Park. These are two great places to go. Awesome. Um, another person asked, uh, what does the red maple pollen serve bees or, or other insects in March? Red maple is, is wind pollinated, which a lot of trees are. So, so the pollen will just float on the wind and go to the female flowers. Insects might visit, but it's generally wind pollinated. You had mentioned some of the resources at the end, um, but so another person was asking if there was a specific resource that would talk about spring ephemerals um, and about nectar, pollen, or both or neither, if they offer those things. Yes, uh, let me let me get back to you on that. Let's in the follow up email. We'll get back to you. Awesome. Um, Jan asked, how common are pink lady slippers? Pink lady slippers. Pink lady slippers are, they flower a little bit later, which is why I didn't show them. They're more of a May, May, May flowering. And they're pretty common um, often in, not in the rich woods that I was talking about that have calcareous soils, but in more um, acidic woods. So fairly common, a uh, real treat to see but more common, for example, than the yellow lady slipper. Polly asked, do swamps or wetlands tend to warm earlier than woodlands in the spring? Generally speaking, the opposite. They tend to, to retain um, they tend to retain cool longer. Many, many wetlands do tend to stay cool uh, longer into the spring, um, partly because the just the thermal mass of the soil, of the wetland soil, sometimes it's peatland soil, just holds the cold and it takes longer for it to warm up. Yeah, I was actually wondering, I had a question about the skunk cabbage, if there is a chemical that causes them to, to create heat. Yes, and I don't, again, I'll have to get back to you. I don't know the exact mechanism but I believe it is a chemical. That's really interesting. I've never known that. <laughs> yeah. Um, Adrian asked, what is the flower behind the Canada Mayflower in the photo you showed? Oh, behind the Canada Mayflower, there was actually a moss. <laughs> that oh. was air cap moss. And that just shows you how, how tiny. So the moss is, is that hair cap moss is standing about an inch tall, basically. Um, but yes, that's what it was. Sometimes the mosses can kind of look like flowers <laughs> on some of them. <laughs> for sure, for sure, yes. Michael asked uh, if you could talk more about bracts. About what? Bracts. B-R-A-C-T-S. Oh, bracts. <laughs> I didn't even say bracts because I, so I like to stay away from that topic because it's confusing. <laughs> Bracts are simply B-R-A-C-T. A bract is simply a modified leaf, really. That's all it is. And um, so sometimes there are modified leaves, tiny leaves underneath the sepals of a flower. They're often green. They are generally green as well. Not always. They can be brown. But they're simply modified leaves. And when, it, when you call it a leaf versus when you call it a bract, there's not total agreement, but they're they're ge generally just tiny modified leaves. Thanks for the question. That's good. Yeah. Robin asked that you had said rue anemone is rare in Vermont, but Robin sees loads of, of them in Newbury. Um, and he said that, that they're close to Connecticut, to the Connecticut River. Um, and I'm wondering if that is why. Well, would you send me a photo? I'd love to. That's great. That is really great. 
Yeah. So, so Robin, question. maybe you can um, get in contact um, with Liz afterwards um, and or me. Um, yeah, send, it to, send, it to, send it to a star and she'll forward it on to me. Thank you. Yeah. So I'll, I can um, I can put my address in the in the chat. Uh, Melissa asked when when do bees come out? Different times for different species, but basically it's temperature. Temperature um, when it's warm enough to move around, um, they they start to come out. But the it's as I said, it's different for different species. And uh, we are just about at we are just at time now, and um, so want to thank everybody for your questions. Um, Liz will write the answers to any of the other questions that are on there. Um, so there will be a follow up with that. So thank you everybody for the questions. So many wonderful questions. Um, I'm just going to put a plug out there that um, we cannot protect the home without, and all of these wildflowers are so important to us and they're so important to all the animals and uh, all the flora and fauna really depend on them and because and for that um, our members really help us to protect land and protect wildflowers so um, if you have the ability to donate please go to our donate link at vlt.org slash donate and there are upcoming events um, there are some wonderful events coming up um, one is the vernal pools uh, but vernal pool reptiles and amphibians on April 9th. Um, and then another one that I'm putting on with many of the SISMAs uh, for invasive species management is tackling invasives together, SISMAs in Vermont. Please come to that if you can. Um, and then an evening with uh, Beaverland author, Leela Phillip is on April 18th. And then we have the Bartown Forest Vernal Pool Walk um, April 30th. So um, we're it's all the time. So please check out our events website and register at vlt.org slash events. Great. And uh, just want to uh, remind everyone uh, that we have a survey after you close out of this webinar. So please fill that out. And it's so helpful to us and to know how to bring better um, content to you. Um, and thank you so much for being here. And thank you, Liz. What a wonderful, um, just like so much new information that I didn't even know every time I every time I come to your webinar. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for being here. And as Astara said, I I look forward to seeing the questions that did not get addressed, and um, we'll answer them um, in writing. We'll answer all of them in writing, and so you'll you'll be able to get those. That's always a fun part of doing this. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks everyone. Um, have a good evening.